Kia ora and welcome to Cinema in Context, where we discuss all things film and the connections between. My name is Jeremy Downing. I'm Sarah Watt. And I'm William Chan. And each month at Cinema in Context, we discuss two films, one current and one retrospective with some connection. That could be the same director, the same actor, or a similar theme. This month, we are discussing Skyscraper, which has just recently come out, and Die Hard, which came out in 1988. The connection being that they are both action films with a large building. <laughs> so Skyscraper, uh, as I see it, has just come out recently. It stars Dwayne Johnson and Neve Campbell. Uh, it is a update, I think, on Die Hard. I think it's pretty clearly pulling it's, from that. Uh, one of those Die Hard clones, the, the, everyone's saying Die Hard in a building. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Uh, and it's, um, yeah, set in Hong Kong. Uh, it is about a, a new fandangled skyscraper that is still under construction, and Dwayne Johnson's character is brought in to advise the insurance company whether or not there has been enough safety protocols being put in place uh, in order for this this building to be built. Uh, and of course, things go wrong. Somebody tries to break in, and hey, Dwayne Johnson gets to be the best Dwayne Johnson he can ever be. <laughs> So that's Skyscraper. William, would you like to give us a bit of an overview on Die Hard? Yeah, sure thing. I'm just going to read from the Die Hard poster, which is, like, an amazing poster. Great. High above the city of LA, a team of terrorists have seized the building, taken hostages, and declared war. One man has managed to escape. An off-duty cop hiding somewhere inside. He's alone, tired, and there's only one chance. Oh, sorry. And the only one chance anyone has got. <laughs> Bruce Willis and Die Hard, 40 stories of sheer adventure. Wow. <laughs> well, I, you know, obviously they said, I take your Die Hard and I raise you 220 stories, <laughs> right? Yeah, right. So, you know, a remake, yeah. uh, remake times... Bigger. Six or whatever, yeah. yeah. Let's just make it bigger. Mm. That's what Lucas said for Star Wars: like bigger, more intense, faster. Mm. It is that, eh? And it's it's like um, uh, the Force Awakens. It's mm. like it's a bigger Death Star, yeah. <laughs> and you know, and they even show that in the Force Awakens by having the little Death Star, and then mm. oh my gosh, it's like ten times as big. Mm, mm. <laughs> but this one here, I love uh, the wind turbine and the fact that the power, the power. Um, controller is in the middle of the wind turbine oh it's mm. also worth mentioning uh, actually that we will be having a fully spoiler filled discussion mm. uh, so, oh my gosh there's a wind turbine in the movie <laughs> <laughs> so if you don't want your Die Hard or skyscraper spoiled then uh, take take a take a moment to go watch the films and come back and listen to what we have to say but yeah, what I will say is the wind turbine when I watched it I thought this is like that scene in Galaxy Quest where Tim Allen and Scorny Weaver have to get to the uh, central nervous system of the ship and they have to make their way through the chompers which are those, <laughs> those large metal kind of clamping walls of metal and Sigourney Weaver's character says what, what, this, this makes no sense what is this here you know and he goes oh it's because it's in the show the, you know it was in the show she goes oh this episode was badly written yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and my friends actually when they saw Skyscraper they messaged me as well a, a gif of that moment of the film <laughs> Because it's like, it's so wonderfully ridiculous. Mm. The kind of control room switch, mainframe switch is in the middle of this wind mm. turbine. Although very similar to Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, which I watched again the other day in anticipation of the newer b- b- one yeah. film. And um, similar sort of, well, two similarities, I guess, with Skyscraper, because, of course, you've got... Um, Quite funny. We did quite enjoy the uh, the duct tape wrapped around oh, the hands. Holy yes. cow! The, the the sort of the, <laughs> as you said the lo fi sort of um, adhesive glove from <laughs> Tom Cruise Mission Impossible becomes duct tape uh, reverse wrapped around <laughs> Dwayne Johnson's hands. Yeah. So there's that um, going around the the tallest and, and in fact of course let's not forget that the pearl is taller than the um, Burj Khalifa in, uh, in Dubai. That point is made, Oh, they, they, they even do the whole Death Star comparisons. Yeah, <laughs> just so you're really clear, this building is really tall. Um, but yeah, and the jumping through, you know, jumping in between, mm. as you say, bits of metal that mm. could easily cleft you in twain. Mm. So, um, cleft you in twain? What a wonderful I use that phrase. phrase. I use that phrase all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I loved the fact that his prosthetic leg became a MacGyver-like tool. He, oh, yes, he uses to jam a, open a, <laughs> the, the lift doors or whatever. Although they spoiler that in the trailer. Oh, do they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. which is a bit of a which is a bit. I didn't silly. watch the trailer. 
Well, I I watched the trailer, and when I first saw the trailer, I said to my husband, this looks like Die Hard meets Annie. Because (laughs) the musical Annie um, is a a wonderful film, one of the best musicals ever made, but it's absolutely petrifying at the very end, and I'm still scarred from seeing it as a young girl, because Mm, Annie has to climb up a... um, Well, I always thought it was a crane when I was little, but you're right, Mm. it's a bridge. It's one of those bridges Mm. that opens up, Mm -hmm. um, and Annie has to climb up it to nothing in order to get away from the... The the Tim baddies. Curry. That's right. It's laughable now to think of Tim Curry as that baddie, but it was frightening at the time. And of course, in Skyscraper, there is a heck of a lot of climbing up a crane mm. and then trying to launch himself onto um that, that the film for me took off at the crane climb. Like I was like happily watching, I was like, oh, this is alright. And then when he started climbing the crane, and the music's amazing in this movie. Oh it my really gosh. does a great job. I was just smiling. I was like, this is wonderful. So fun. It's so much fun. He, 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 it's great how they try and portray Dwayne Johnson as an everyman, you guys, you know. <laughs> he's just, you know, he, he has a prosthetic limb. He's just trying to support his family. Daddy loves who? Daddy, oh, Daddy loves who? Daddy, Daddy loves, loves who? who? Which has got to be the lamest <laughs> catchphrase or whatever. Even I don't com- know. It even comes back at the end, which I is I know. Bonkers. And it doesn't come back clever. <laughs> like, I thought, oh, they're going to they're have a twist on Daddy loves all of us. Or mom or himself. <laughs> or Bruce Will. Even, uh, no, but, no, but it's anyway. great because at the beginning of the movie, that they they make a lot of effort to show you that Dwayne Johnson, you know, he gets beat up, he he loses fights, yeah. uh, his bag gets taken, and he doesn't catch the bad guy. You know, we could we could I'm be Dwayne Johnson, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then, as you say, Jeremy, he scales a what is it like five hundred meter crane <laughs> from the outside, and then he jumps. He jumped. See, the scaling lost it for me. I mean, yeah. don't get me wrong. I enjoyed the film and stuff. Yeah. And I, you know, <laughs> I, I didn't exactly have suspension of disbelief issues. But when he climbed the crane, there was no indication of peril whatsoever. <laughs> and I don't know whether to applaud the fact that the filmmaker didn't go for that total cliche of the close up on the foot as it slips. <laughs> and then the hand yeah. grabs again. Yeah. They didn't bother with that. They dispensed with no. that entirely. But all the, it just really felt like he's in a studio and he's just kind of mm-hmm. climbing. Climbing, not something not very high or perilous. You know, that's how I felt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I will say though that the uh, explosions of gas explosions in the sort of nature reserve with the kids that was that really was thrilling, very good. And I and I really enjoyed the the bridge, the homemade bridge across the oh my the, gosh. the chasm. That was so great, but so dumb. <laughs> House again, Dwayne Johnson. I mean, every man, Dwayne Johnson. Oh, he lifts, oh, he holds lifts the bridge. The, I yeah. forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's great. <laughs> you see his face, and he's straining, and it's like, oh my gosh, I almost believe a human being can do that. <laughs> In terms of its being kind of an intelligent up, no, I can't believe I'm even saying an intelligent <laughs> update. Let's rewind. <laughs> In terms of its being an update on the 1988 movie. <laughs> I guess it's kind of a good thing. Like, um, Bonnie Bedelia was 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 no shrinking violet in the Die Hard mm. film. However, Neve Campbell's character is a military surgeon who's had experience on the front lines. I love that. Yeah. Um, who knows how it, to solve every medical emergency <laughs> and studied East, East Asian studies at university. Yeah, and yeah. therefore happens oh. to speak um, Cantonese. Yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> I don't know. And she was cool, calm, and collected the whole time. And that red T-shirt was great. didn't yeah. even get sweaty. So, um, <laughs> so and in a way, oh, it's like speaking great. Speaking of cool but... and calm, that, that scene where she and kid number B, I, I don't mm. even remember which kid. The kids are nothing. Yeah, yeah. The kids. Well, when, when they... Henry and Georgia. Oh, I remember okay. that. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of those things. Yeah. <laughs> um, when they, you know, Dwayne's like, okay, this is how we get down the, the elevator. You have to cut the line, but it's oh, okay. Because yeah. there's mm. going to be, like, induction breaks and all that. And they're like, okay, okay. Mm. And they're free falling into a fiery pit of hell. Mm. And they are just the most calm mm. any human being can be while free falling <laughs> into a fiery pit of hell. Oh, and they're counting down. It's like five, four, three. My goodness. Because he said to her, just count down from five. Yeah. So she gets in a lift and does the button, mm-hmm. and I start counting. It's a bit like when, do you do this thing, like when people swim underwater in oh, movies? Yeah. Can you hold your breath yeah, yeah, to yeah. see whether you could have done Speaking it too? Speaking of, uh, of Mission Impossible, the last one, <laughs> where he's underwater for like five minutes, and mm-hmm. you're oh, I can't breathe. <laughs> right. So I instinctively go, I'm going to start counting. And then I'm like, she hasn't started counting. Neve, 
Start counting. Yeah, no, I thought the same Dude, thing. Dude, you've got five seconds. What are you doing? And then she starts, and I'm like, this is going to end terribly. <laughs> She's several seconds behind. But by some miracle, it all worked out. I, I loved that she was able to neutralize that guy. That I can't remember what he did, but she does some back flip, flip around kick, oh, yeah. punch. Mm. And I'm like, oh, that's right. She's had training. Uh, you know, it's, I mean, it's a weak plot point, but <laughs> it works. And I thought, yeah, go you film for having a... She doesn't have to be saved by Dwayne. No. And uh, she, she, you know, I was a little bit like, oh, she has to have the chick fight in the car at the end. You know, oh, yeah. yeah. Like, the super assassin chick. That's just such a cliche. Oh, <laughs> the super assassin chick, chick with the immaculate hair. Yeah. yeah that just... Chick. Despite being but, in humid Hong Kong. Um, the amount of cliches they or stereotypes. Like the German hacker. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, it was just... I said, my, my thing was full of cliches, explosions, and Dwayne Johnson being the best dad ever. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the thing, right? Did the filmmakers think to themselves, we're going to do it a little tongue-in-cheek because everybody's going to compare this to Die Hard. And, so therefore, and, and you know, Die Hard is a fairly tongue-in-cheek movie as mm-hmm. well as being truly thrilling. So, do you know, did they think, oh, it's okay if we chuck in a couple of cliches or we make it a little bit woohoo, jokey, rather than making it serious? Or did they think that it was a serious movie? I think it's pretty jokey, isn't it? Um, but I also think that they don't play a lot of it for laughs. Like, like the, the, the truly funny bits are the ones that are unintentional, right? Right. right. Um, so that's what I'm wondering. Do they know that? The horrible core and callbacks and some of the character work. Um, the, so, sorry, I'll just jump forward a little mm. bit or jump back a little bit. When, um, when they're getting ready for their trip, right? Are you talking about Skyscraper? Skyscraper, yeah. yes. Uh, and um, I can't even remember what his character I'll just call him Dwayne. Um, <laughs> yeah. Dwayne says, oh, Th- or Dwayne or, or Neve is like, thank goodness for your buddy who got this got us this job. And I I, I oh. turned to Sarah and was like, he's a baddie. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Brad, later, or whatever his name is, yeah. ben, 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 he'll, ben. He'll be the baddie. And I was like, don't be ridiculous. And if you William. weren't sure, the <laughs> facial scarring gives it away. I saw the facial scarring. I'm like, oh. It's on his face. <laughs> he's bad. I didn't. I thought, oh, he's clearly one of the guys. No, I actually thought that I was, was like, no, slightly Dwayne... intelligent. They didn't spell it out that he was one of the guys whose life has been ruined by Dwayne Johnson's <laughs> bad call. Oh. I was like, this movie, I was like, Dwayne's got the... Dwayne's got the injury, the, the injury that hasn't affected his face, uh-huh. and yeah. then his friend has or got the facial life. scar. Yeah, yeah. 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 sex life. <laughs> <laughs> and and for all these secret baddies, the, the movie holds its shots for just a little too long. So they get to like shiftily look around, yeah. <laughs> and Noah Taylor. My goodness, Noah Taylor. Why cast Noah Taylor as a secret baddie? Oh, was he the? He's the insurance guy. He's the insurance guy. Or, yeah. or as a Brit. You know what I mean? Like, there's a scene. There's a scene um, where he's threatening the kids, and he's like, I I think verbatim the line is, "That's right. Listen to your mummy." (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that seemed very, very, yeah, jokey. One thing I thought was, you know, I was when they introduced the pearl. I was thinking, Mm -hmm. okay, this is our climax. Like, that's where the climax is going to be. I was Mm -hmm. like, what's going to be in the pearl? And then they went up there, and, it's, and I was like, this is really underwhelming. It's, a whole lot of, it's just a whole lot of TVs. And the guy's like, like, this will be the biggest tourist attraction in the world. Yeah. I'm like, well, it probably will be very big, because mm-hmm. I think about the Padronas Towers, and you go up there and to stand in a, in a virtual world. But then I'm like, that could be anywhere. Mm-hmm. You could have the pearl it could on, be the ground, on the ground. Yeah. yeah. It would feel like yeah. you're in it. Um, well, the, that, that pearl was amazing when he did do the, look, you're looking down and, you know, mm-hmm. remove all the walls thing. That was amazing. The m- billion cameras or whatever. Mm-hmm. But the whole business with the, oh, let's put up a whole lot of mirrors like in the end of John Wick 2. And, and, and the end of um, Enter the Dragon. And like. all the other films <laughs> since forever. And why would you pay to go into that? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I might, but I don't know that I'd go to Hong Kong and go up a 220 story building <laughs> for it. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what I mean. Um, and, and you know the, the opening, the opening prologue with him, <clears throat> you know the family being blown up, mm-hmm. that kind of thing, and then that being repeated at the end with yes. his daughter mm. flipping just, around. The and thing, there's like, the child. It, it, it kind of was by the numbers, but it kind of didn't work. Like <laughs> it didn't really have the same kind of weight that it, I think it wanted oh, to no. have. Well, this and this, this you know, and I, I, I've said this, but this is my big query: Did they, if they meant it to be a bit silly? They could have gone further. And if they didn't mean it to be a bit silly, they shouldn't have gone silly at all. Mm. Because I do think that things... I mean, you know, I enjoyed it, but for me it was a three-star movie. And I'm not even very discerning. <laughs> so, you know... I gave it three stars. I give it more stars than Jurassic World, Fallen Kingdom. Mm. See, I actually really enjoyed Jurassic World. Right. Um, 
but I had no, you know, flesh in the game or whatever, the skin in the game or whatever. I was just like, oh, you know, I'll just enjoy this. But, but anyway, so Skyscraper was, was fine, but I don't know. Um, could they have done it better? I think so. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. I mean, just look at Die Hard. Mm. <laughs> now, let's talk about Die Hard because, you know, Die Hard, yeah. for all of its 80s-ness and 80s hairdos, man, it's a great movie. Mm. It's so tight and so... Um, just has a lovely arc to it. It just mm. builds and builds and builds. I, I just can't believe that uh, apparently they don't have the, the script even finished when they started shooting because it feels like such a puzzle box of a movie, mm. right? Mm. Um, so many... Uh, we were just talking about callbacks and call forwards. Like, so many of the ones in Die Hard are so elegant and even on the nth re- repeat viewing, you just forget that, oh, this is actually a huge plot point, mm. but it's not, like, signaled or there's no flashing neon lights about it, mm. which is what Skyscraper does. Yeah, mm. right. Um, the thing with the iPad, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> the like, inhaler, the, you know, yeah. all, all, all the stuff. All the stuff, yeah. all the stuff. Yeah, I agree. She uh, studied East Asian languages, <laughs> <laughs> studies or whatever. <laughs> Gee, I wonder if that's relevant. No. Anyway, mm, I, Die Hard. I just think, you know, there was this was the mm. film that really announced Bruce Willis as an action hero. And, yes. And before this, he was a TV comedian. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's really Bruce Willis's, Bruce Willis's on show, mm. you know, all of his, his, little, his little facial expressions and things. <laughs> um, but man, he does a great job. He's such a great force of nature on that screen. And I love, love, love that right from the start, he's made vulnerable by the fact that he's wearing bare feet. Yes. Mm-hmm. And he has bare feet through the whole movie, yes. I think. Yeah. Do you remember in A Quiet, um, a quiet Place, um, the, the, the wonderful business, um, the tension of them having to be quiet, and as they go down into the, the stairs into the cellar, there's a nail that's sticking yes. up. Mm-hmm. Do I remember and, that? Of course I remember. Right. And so there's such, <laughs> enor- it's such wonderful audience empathy to mm. think, oh, oh my gosh, please don't tread on that. And so, yeah, you're so right about Die Hard. You don't even have to be have wussy feet like me, like I do, to think, <laughs> oh, ah, oh, the glass, mm, ow, yeah. the burning and all that sort of thing. Um, and it's just like a very easy, subtle, effective way of um, sort of the fact that Bruce Willis is quite built in that. You know what I mean? He's not a weedy, a weedy man. Mm-hmm. So he already is kind of a bigger person who already has some advantages. It's a mm. really nice way of not exactly equalizing it, but sort of pulling down some of those advantages, isn't it? Yeah, things aren't all perfect. It's not all going yeah. to plan. But they didn't plan. bother with that, with, with Dwayne Johnson. Oh, no, because- they did. They did. When he hopped into the building and he was in the rubble mm. and, and it was that glass picking bit from Die Hard where he was like, oh, man, my limbs. But it felt so contrived and so <laughs> fake because you just saw him leap from a crane. Whereas mm. Bruce Willis never does anything that ridiculous. Like, mm. he, he does stunts and they're crazy stunts, mm. but they're not superhuman, like, you know. What yeah, 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 yeah. I think you make a really interesting point, Jeremy, that it was Bruce Willis's breakout as an action hero. Um, because, and this is tricky because I have seen Die Hard recently and you do watch it with all of the knowledge of the three, four, however mm-hmm. many films that have followed and so on. But but it was startling to watch the dude from Moonlighting um, being mm-hmm. this action hero. And yet Dwayne Johnson, I'm, I mean, I love Dwayne Johnson, but he brings his career, his mm. oeuvre, his reputation with him, doesn't he, into every mm. film. Mm. So automatically you're like, you know this is going to be fine. Um, whereas I feel like in 1988, watching Bruce Willis in that role, I don't know, you knew he was probably going to be fine because he was built like a brick, you mm. know. But, but he wasn't completely jacked, right? A lot of nah. people talk about his dad bod and how it's it's attainable, even though he's in, in really good <clears throat> shape. Yeah. Um, and that does, like, make a huge difference. Yeah. Mm. Like, he, he's not a cartoon superhero. No. Um, he's, he's a cop, and he's going to do his job, but he doesn't want to, and that's that's the great thing about it. Yeah. Mm. Can I share with you my my most wonderful one of my most wonderful film ex- cinema experiences, which is a Die Hard one? Um, a few Christmases ago, we were in Denver visiting our beloved family, and we were taken to the Alamo Draft House, which is um, a, a chain of cinemas that specialise in craft beer and film. And we went to a special screening a couple of nights before Christmas where they laid on a four-course meal um, with beer match um, while you sat and watched Die Hard. And the food was um, specifically designed to match um, elements of the film. Uh So, for example, we started off with um, deep-fried camembert, 
uh, or brie cheese, you know, gooey mm. cheese, um, that was brought out to us around the moment where Bruce Willis has got off the plane and he takes his shoes off and he's scrunching his toes in the carpet. <laughs> um, and so I guess it was a toe cheese kind of like, you know, um, connection. And then we had Salisbury steak in like a um, uh, TV dinner. And we had... Um, Twinkies for dessert, ah, Twinkies and, and chocolate <laughs> sauce for dessert, because that's what the, yeah. the cop was eating. Mm-hmm. And I say four course, I can't remember now. But anyway, the most wonderful experience, because it was a couple of days before Christmas, it was snowy, um, mm. we were obviously in America, and watching this classic movie of our youth with oh, this fantastic, fantastic meal. I love it. It was so great. That's, so, yeah. That reminds me of um, those mystery those mystery movies that they do in the, in the UK, mm-hmm. where you jump on a bus mm-hmm. and you don't, know, you don't know what you're going to see. Mm. And there was one where they, so people get onto a bus they pull up and they offload into a, a recreation of um los angeles uh 2019 blade runner and so you're walking through the kind of craziness of blade runner and then you go into this warehouse and they watch blade runner <laughs> and moments of the film they recreated like they do with the rocky horror picture show mm. but they did the final roy batty and rick dickard oh. um kind of scene way above at the top of the uh, warehouse and they had people on wires dangling wow. off the edge of the warehouse. What a great thing to do. They had projected imagery from the film so it looked like they were up there. They had doves. They had all, you know, mm. and it, it just, there's, there's an article about it as well. Mm. It's wow. so great. And actually, sorry, just to, on that same note, I love this. That's great. I love the story because another thing that I know another company have done, they invited a whole lot of people to watch an outdoor movie on, in, in the ocean. They, they roped off a section of the beach Put everybody on floating, uh-huh. and then they showed them Jaws. Jaws, of course they did. And, yeah. <laughs> and then it was—I think it was a promotion for vodka or something. Mm. They were canning on this vodka, but yeah, that's that's awesome. It was cool Die Hard time. Mm. Well, let's talk about Die Hard as a Christmas film because mm. a lot of talk has been made about how it's the greatest Christmas film of all time. Mm. And then just last week, Bruce Willis comes out and says, definitively, it is not a Christmas film. Oh, who? What does he know? Yeah. How is he an authority? On this <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's it got to do? He's with only that? the star. Yeah. <laughs> I still hold a flag for Batman Returns as being mm. one of the greatest Christmas movies of all time. Is it just because they're set at Christmas? Yeah, I think yeah. so. They're hardly the themes of Christmas <laughs> in no. a film. It's just fun to have these alternative Christmas movies that mm. are kind of anything but. Mm. Sort of, I guess, anti-Christmas films, yep. aren't they? All the Lethal Weapons. Um, are they all Christmas are they all movies? Oh, Christmas? at least um, uh, Lethal Weapon 1 is. Really? Um, yeah, yeah. Was yeah, that yeah. made before or after Die Hard? Was it before? Before, I want to say before. Perhaps it's just really canny marketing people back in the 80s going, hey, this film is going to be yesterday's newspaper, <laughs> so why don't we set it at Christmas yeah. so that a generation of fans will co- revisit this film every Christmas? Yeah, right. That's what I would have thought. <laughs> <coughs> it sounds sounds legit to me. Gremlins, yeah. awesome Christmas. Well, you, yeah, yeah, and I watched, well. yeah, yeah, and I watched that last Christmas because oh, of that. That's shivers. so funny. <laughs> so there you go. So we are all suckers for it. Lethal Weapon is 1987. Oh, one year. Okay, one mm. year. So that would have been in the production that's around about the same time. Wouldn't yes. It? Mm. Um, so the other person in this film that I do feel's career was launched, or at least... Alan? Rickman. Mm-hmm. He's... Isn't Amazing. he brilliant? Amazing. I love him in comedic roles as well. Amazing. He is so funny. When he does that whole bit where he pretends to be the American... Uh, you're oh, one yes. of them. <laughs> oh, no. And then he's like, and then Bruce Willis goes, man, you're amazing at that accent. And I'm thinking it wasn't a great accent. <laughs> I mean, I love you, Alan, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're still Alan Rickman. <laughs> that was marvelous. I feel as though, and I'm, this is apocryphal. I'm making this up. But anyway, um, this is my story and I'm sticking with it. I feel as though that was something of an advent of, British actors being brought in as baddies mm. um, in, in films because after that obviously there's Jeremy Irons and a whole mm-hmm, lot of people mm. who and admittedly I think in Die Hard Die Hard 3, three yeah he Sean plays Bean. but Jeremy Irons plays a German I think well, he plays his brother R- right. Hans Gruber's yeah, brother yeah oh that's great <laughs> right so, it's like perfect casting I've seen it but they all just blur into when we blob and but as you say Sean Bean so yes suddenly mm-hmm. we're getting lots of um, people from what was then across the pond and it was mm. kind of like well hello British person mm. you can be in our movie but you have to play the baddie yeah you know mm-hmm. he's great hey isn't he just he's so he's so charismatic who Alan Alan Rickman yeah. Yeah. Hans Gruber yeah um, <laughs> all of his henchmen are just doofuses but he's yeah. just great and his his, you know, and I love that part where he goes on the walkie talkie. Goes, we request you release blah blah blah, and you release blah blah blah, and they and his henchman goes, who are these people? He's like, I don't know. I read it in the time. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and effectively, he's playing the terrorist mm. role, just a kind of yeah. You know, 
Um, and it's that thing you can't teach that Alan Rickman, and I'm not saying this because he's passed and we're all getting sentimental. I honestly feel this. Um, Alan Rickman has a certain sort of presence that mm. the lead guy in, oh, not the lead, the lead baddie in Skyscraper doesn't have. Oh my he's gosh. fine. He's fine. He's adequate as your generic Scandinav- Scandinavian slash Eastern European baddie. Mm-hmm. But I kept thinking, for starters, I kept thinking early on, oh, is it Simon Pegg in disguise? And was disappointed <laughs> that it wasn't and realised it shouldn't have been anyway. <laughs> but he felt like the guy you have when you can't get the guy you want mm. in a film. I honestly feel that way. Whereas Alan Rickman just sort of has, uh, like Prisoner. I say, he it's just has swagger. that X factor. Yeah. yeah. He's wonderful. Um, I did think that the film is fully playing to the trope of the useless police cops. You know, that trope of like certain things can only happen mm-hmm. because the policemen are really useless. Mm. Um, and apart from the one wonderful character, I don't even can't remember his name, the one that kind of talk, Our, yeah. he's so great. <clears throat> even the FBI are useless and they kind of... I, I, I forgot that the FBI guys die. I, I just completely forgot about that. They explode. And, and then, of course, they then joke about it. Oh, we're going to need more FBI guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's rough. That's wonderful, and and um, but yeah, he um, that character. What's his name? Uh, uh, Al, Sergeant Powell. Al Sergeant Powell. Powell. He's great, and yeah. also the African American representation in this film is, yeah. is pretty impressive. Like, mm. There's a good range of black characters. <laughs> mm. um, I mean, the female representation is a whole other story, but mm-hmm. um, the, the 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 cop, the FBI agent, the hacker, and yeah. the cab driver, mm-hmm. or the li- oh, sorry, the limo driver. Um, there's there's some great characters in there that. Sergeant Al from well. Die Hard turns up in Die Hard 2 and in Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Mm. So that's yeah. a nice um, <laughs> callback, throwback, whatever, isn't it? That's cute. I, I, I do love how in Die Hard, I mean, you have basically two main characters plus, you know, the, the sergeant on the, on the ground. But, um, <laughs> but they seem to be really the only competent ones in the entire movie. Yeah. And then, you know, you have the authorities, you have the henchmen, you have the... Um, what's his name? What's the um, the the coked up um, Wall Street trader? Oh my gosh, he's the one amazing. that goes does the speech. Yeah. He is amazing. He's Hans, buddy, uh, your buddy. <laughs> and Bruce, I'm your white knight. Hans, this guy doesn't know what kind of guy you yeah. are, but I know what kind of guy you are. Please let him go. He doesn't know what I am. Tell him you don't know who I am. Oh come on, John. We go way back. <laughs> and has like um, knowing nose tipping. Yeah. And, oh yeah, he's great. But it's just, I, I love how so much of the movie revolves around, and mainly just um, uh, uh, John McClane and Hans Gruber, mm. a kind of reacting to the sea of fools mm. almost. Yeah, and they're they're sort of polar opposites in that mm. they're you know they they both know what's going on, mm. um, but are almost kind of helpless to you know to make any difference because everyone around them is just a doofus. an idiot. Yeah. It's quite a wonderful construct, the use of walkie-talkies and how they're able to have these conversations. And uh, it, it's a really clever way of, of building up character. Mm-hmm. Um, I, do, I will say that the wife, she, she's pretty onto it. She just doesn't really do anything. Yeah. And the, the, is it Tanaka? Is that his name? The boss? Oh, um, Tagaki. 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 He's great, but of course he dies very early, early on in the film. But he, he knows what's going on and he's, he's onto it. Uh, but you're right. The rest of the film is is fools, and it, and it needs and they need to be fools in order for the story to work. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and in terms of the fools or, or the build up of of silly things, um, the movie just ramps up beautifully. Like it starts off with a scenario, and it's great how Hans Gruber's plan is basically let everything escalate to fever pitch, and then you know no one will know what the <clears> heck <throat> is going. We'll blow up the building, and we'll just. Escape with money because at the end of the day, it wasn't for anything. It was just for money, mm. and that's beautiful. So well done. Mm, mm. I was wondering if they were going to use. I was trying because I, I couldn't remember rewatching it. What mm-hmm. happened? And uh, I was thinking, oh, are, they, are they getting off with the helicopters or? Uh, and and it, it kind of doesn't doesn't really. I mean, I know you're saying, but it doesn't really make sense. Like, how are they going to get mm-hmm. away? Are they going to get away in the chaos of it all? I guess is their plan. Yeah. Doesn't matter though, does it? It just we just <laughs> need we need to know that he thinks he knows what he's doing, and for the story just to kind of explode and escalate. Mm-hmm. I do love that um, that shot when he dies. That famous shot when mm. he falls in slow motion. Mm. 
Um, it's, it's wonderful. And the stunt of that, the guy falling, someone actually was falling down and mm-hmm. probably fell into a big pile of boxes or something. But. And it's great how we're doing this on the 30th anniversary of Die Hard and Ooh. all the articles are coming out. Are we? Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, uh, yeah, it's been weeks of articles about Die Hard, retrospectives and all oh, that stuff. I didn't Really, really, really mm. cool. Mm. Mm. Um, but, but of course, like one of the, the interviews with Jan de Bon, who was the cinematographer of Die Hard, um, he, he was talking about capturing that final shot and how they had to develop um, new technology to get the focus just right. Because, mm. because of course, it's a free-falling actor mm. and you have to keep focus on his face at all times. Mm. And of course, they, what they wanted to capture was that not just the realization, uh, sorry, not just the, the fear of the fall, but also that realization on Alan Rickman's face that he is going to die. Mm. And how satisfying that whole thing is when it all comes together. Mm. I was looking at the scene and seeing that Die Hard was nominated for four Academy Awards. Mm. I mean, technical awards, but still, I mean, it was, it was quite great to see that that type of film was acknowledged by the Academy. Mm. I mean, now, by today's standards, a lot of that technology, you know, it doesn't feel that amazing. But mm-hmm. um, in terms of actually just creating a thrilling experience, it still holds up. Yeah. Does really anyone does. go off the edge of Skyscraper? Uh, I mean, Dwayne Johnson climbs around. No, no, I mean, does anybody oh, die yeah. going off the edge? I don't know. <clears throat> oh, someone falls in the central part of it, doesn't they fall off the Oh, yeah, the no, bridge. Taylor. Yeah. Um, and then the guy at the end kind of falls and gets blown up by grenade, which is pretty gratuitous. <laughs> uh, so nobody, <laughs> no. I mean, and fair enough, too, that nobody actually falls 220 stories down onto the, the no, all no. the people who spend the whole movie there watching what's oh, going on. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. But the citizens of Hong Kong. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, this is back to this um, uh, bringing in China into Hollywood films, isn't uh-huh. it? And setting it in Hong Kong. Massively. And, and, and yeah. so much... So much, um, I guess, Cantonese dialogue, yeah. right? And mm. and then subtitles, and then not, which mm-hmm. I th- I really like. But yeah, very very much for a Chinese market, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. And it, um, yeah, this is just a, a really interesting thing. Like, we have this movie, we have, gosh, the the last two Transformers movies, which they're big, big budget movies. Mm. And I guess China is just really into this. This and kind the Great of, Wall would oh, that count? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Gr- Great Wall and um. Uh, gosh, what uh, Pacific Rim Uprising? Yeah. Like the, these movies that feel like they're kind of out of the mid nineties, early two thousands. Mm. Um, that the Chinese audience seem to really, really dig. Mm. Um, but of course, you know, The Great War and Pacific Rim and Skyscraper did not do well in the US box office. Mm. And maybe it's th- that's just not the target audience anymore for these movies. That's such an interesting point, then, isn't it? Well, I mean, or is it? But it is for me. me If you want films to be sustainable and you want to create films, I mean, it is that whole thing. You can't please all of the people all of the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And yes, okay, so we're thinking, I've got a Venn diagram in my head and you've Mm -hmm. got your, what the USA wants, what the Chinese market wants, and there'd be a fairly hefty intersecting set. Mm -hmm. But what is it that is making this a three-star movie uh, for the Western audiences? What is being sacrificed perhaps Mm -hmm. or not being as, as developed? And what does there need to be specifically or more of in order to engage the Chinese audience that actually the American audience is a bit meh about, I don't really know. Mm. Yeah. I think it's just cultural differences, isn't it? And mm. when what people want from storytelling and how does it, how does it reflect social consciousness or the, the national consciousness? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I guess you, you can't, at, yeah, you can't satisfy both of those things at the same time in the mm. same film, probably, right? Mm. We look at Bollywood films and how, um, how stylistically they're so different to a lot of Western films, mm-hmm. or at least Western films today. But they, they're, you know, quite a lot of melodrama, um, the, the very, you know, um, serious topics, but then also jumping into music. Mm. Uh, just they're very different experiences. Yeah. Mm. Um, and, and some fantastic, I mean, I watched some, some Bollywood films and thought, these are fantastic movies. I can see the craftsmanship. Mm-hmm. But they're just so stylistically strange to me as a Western viewer. Mm. Um, it's just very different. But they don't engage you on quite the same level. Not in the same way. I mean, mm. there's a little bit, it feels sometimes really ridiculous, but it's just different different style of storytelling. To be perfectly honest, I feel that way about a lot of French films. And I'm a Francophile. I speak a degree of the language. Um, but I find that French comedies mm. just annoy the crap out of me. <laughs> they are strange. They are from, from my perspective. Right. Yeah. Me, um, you know. Possibly with the exception of C'est la Vie, which opened the French Film Festival recently. And I went and I was like, well, we'll see. And I really enjoyed it. And it was quite stupid and foolish in a lot of ways. But for some reason, it really worked for me. But by and large, nowadays, if you get your Gérard Depardieu and your... 
Um, <clears throat> I'll think of it eventually. The bloke who's in every blooming film now. Daniel O'Toole. Daniel O'Toole, definitely. And then there's all this kind of farcical stuff going on. And I'm like, oh, really? (laughs) And yet these films do massively well in the French box office. Mm. Great. Great. I get it. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I don't get it personally, but fine. But then I think, but what is it that's, that's... that makes it so different for mm. them and for me. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. If we flip that on its head and think about some of our Kiwi films that have actually done really well overseas, that's this is not helping the conversation at all. But I think about Hunt for the Wilder People. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we think about the, you know, we talk about the very Kiwi esque Taika Waititi humor in, in Thor, Thor and how yeah. huge yeah. that's been. That's, yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's hard. It's very strange. It, it, it's it's an interesting, it's an interesting discussion point, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Cultural yeah. response <clears throat> to types of storytelling mm-hmm. and. And why do why do certain countries have different or, or you know why do certain people have different responses to various different types of art? Different it's styles, strange, isn't it? Not. Yeah, it is. It is. And then you have like uh, the movie I mentioned there at the end of last year, Wolf Warriors Two, which was the highest grossing movie I think in the world, even though it was only released in China. Mm. And and that kind of bombastic action uh, movie, which is straight out of the eighties, but the Chinese mm. people just dig it. It's really jingoistic. Patriot, this patriotism is, yeah. is oozing out of every one of its pause and you have you know a sniveling baddie and arnold like goody and you know the american market is just it's so moved on from that stuff but you you have a booming industry that's kind of spearheading this revival in china i wonder if if it's rather than moved on it's that it's again reflecting where they are as a country like i think about how the 1970s in american cinema was very much a time of cynicism because Mm. of the what they'd been through in the last 10 15 years and the same thing with the current uh, state of american politics and what's going Mm. on i think there's a lot of um uh, both both a lot of critique in, in cinema, but also a desire for absolute outrageousness because we need to escape the kind of craziness of of what's going on. Mm. So, I, and I also wonder if there's a sort of a return mm. to some of those seventies and eighties styles of films now. So, I wonder if it's the same thing with, with the Chinese market. Um, and I don't know enough about Chinese politics or where they're at, but mm. there's something happening within their space mm. that these types mm. of films are appealing to some sense of of what what people need. Mm-hmm. And I guess also I have to acknowledge that um in in China it's as has here and as uh, in America you still have your what we might call more indie movies mm-hmm. that are coming out that are like I saw a film recently a Cantonese language movie called Paradox which was terrific infernal affairs or um uh departed. the departed yeah. style of police corruption and uh, missing child fathers on the hunt blah blah, mm. blah 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 and it was treated seriously and it was intricate and it was clever and it was gritty and it was you know just like you want those sorts of films to be so i'm, I'm certainly not thinking that it's like transformers nine or don't bother at all <laughs> um, but in terms of those big blockbusters i wonder i wonder what yeah Kind of going on from blockbuster talk, um, I, I do want to bring bring it back to Die Hard and say how refreshing it is to have a smart movie like Die Hard be just this huge blockbuster as well. And so often nowadays, you know, it's 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 mutually exclusive. You either yeah. have you know something that's more cerebral, or you have just the boss the war action kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, and like Die skyscraper, Hard, like, like which doesn't have. <laughs> cleverness in it no. well actually I, I i would not say it's balls the war action uh, action is adequate no 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 <laughs> but, but i don't think there's i mean apart from that, i loved the world building yeah. at the beginning of it you know mm-hmm. i loved learning about the pearl and, and yeah. seeing the mm-hmm. building yeah. but then it became just right it became yeah. a um narratively it became a very straightforward sort yeah. of yeah yeah that's right mm-hmm. um but yeah just having having something that that is, I mean, at the, the root of it, a character study or two character studies mm. of the goody and the baddie. Um, and to develop, develop this bombastic action movie around that is so cool. Mm. And I don't think, I mean, obviously Die Hard has all of its, all of its clones, right? You have yeah. Speed and you Die Hard on a bus, Die Hard on a plane, Die Hard on Air Force One, that, that kind of thing. Um, but Die Hard does it best, of course. And mm. it's just, it's so cool to always go back and, and see just all the craftsmanship not only uh, amongst the action and the special effects, but in the character work and the dialogue and the acting. Absolutely. Like, the work is there, eh? Like, mm-hmm. they've done their work at, at multiple levels. And I think that's why mm-hmm. it is so endearing and why it's been so... Um, Beloved. Bel- was, yeah. yeah. And, and, and has had longevity in terms yeah. of its, its fandom. Yeah, um, yeah. There's something about that film that really is a statement about 1980s action films. 
Um, I, you know, I, I, you sort of think of that movie. I think of it alongside your Terminator and your mm. um, uh, Aliens and your what else came out that time? True, I guess the James Cameron canon, isn't it? Yeah. Um, there's some really great stuff that happened around that. Well, time. that Arnold. I mean, that was Arnold in his prime. Yeah, yeah. and just Commando. really great character work with a, a great action premise s- <laughs> got to go along with it. You know? Yeah. That didn't have to worry about all this feminism and all the sexism <laughs> issues. None of that was a problem. I don't know if I told you, but we rewatched True Lies over Christmas. Oh, all right. right. And it's a really great film. And it's also really like, are you serious? It's really racist. Did you just make her wear that <laughs> yeah. and do that and whatever? Mm. But things we didn't know when we saw it the well, first time. Well, interesting talking about um, that. I mean, that's the film that Eliza Dishku um, has come from. Oh, yes. She was sexually assaulted on, wasn't it? That's right. And um, she played the daughter, huh? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So it's, um, you know, for, for as great as those films were, I'm glad that we're, we are moving on from those times and mm-hmm. we're talking about some of those issues. And we are critiquing the representation of women back in the day. You know, yeah. you, you look at it through the lens of that's just how it was back then. Yeah. But I think it's, it's for all of Skyscraper's vapidness, <clears throat> um, you know, I think it's great. Neve Campbell's character is good. Mm. Uh, she's, she's, a, she's a much better uh, character in terms of what she does than mm. the wife and Die yeah. Hard. Yes. Yeah, the wife and Die Hard is a more believable person. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're kind of damned if they do and damned if they don't, aren't well, they? Yeah. I mean, my having said half an hour ago, oh, it's really obvious that she's set up as this strong character. But if they hadn't, then we'd be criticising them for not having created a strong female character. And that's so. why they have the assassin with the hair. <laughs> <laughs> And the little girl. Do you remember when the when the um, the baddie says to her, "Are you the princess of the oh, castle?" Oh my and, gosh. She's, and what does she say? Like, I'm, I'm the, the queen. king. Yeah. I'm the queen. No, I don't I'm, even think I'm, she says I'm the queen. queen. She yeah. says, "I'm, I'm the king." king. Yeah. Oh, cool. So, and, and you're like, "Hmm, welcome to 2018." <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and I was like, "Wait, is this guy supposed to be our main baddie?" And he was. <laughs> Where's Simon Pegg? Yeah. <laughs> I was really shocked as well. In, uh, sorry, in Die Hard when the that scene when the reporters go in and talk to the, the kids. Oh yeah, I was like, yeah. Oh, this is really weird. I mm-hmm. thought the reporter was being set up as a hero. They kind of break in and, and, and talk mm-hmm. to the kids. And, and then threaten the maid with deportation. Oh, and, yeah. That was really yeah. problematic as well. But, um, of course, the, the reporter's um, what's-his-face from Ghostbusters. Yeah, it is uh, too. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Atherton, is that... Is that the actor's name? I'm not sure. William Atherton, I, I think. I can't remember, yeah. um, and he, he just has such this weasley, punchable face, and, and it gets punched all the time. <laughs> it's great. I was thinking about the violence in this film. It's like we can punch yeah. someone; it's all good. <laughs> but but it's great because you know the at the end of the day, the people who who are brave and kind of well, the McLeans, I guess, yeah, um, and and Al Sergeant Al, like they they get the heroes, you know, ending, and all the baddies and the the not so nice people get their comeuppance and. It's, it's great. A real Christmas movie. Thank you for listening to another episode of Cinema in Context. If you enjoyed our podcast, then please share it with your film-loving friends. You can listen to Cinema in Context through SoundCloud or through Apple Podcasts. You can follow us on Facebook or subscribe to us on Twitter or YouTube, which are also great places to let us know what you think of this episode or give us suggestions for future films to discuss or compare. Look out for our next episode in a month's time. And until then, ka kite anō.